está a cargo del doctor Peter DiCaprio. A continuación, me permitiré leer una breve semblanza del doctor. El doctor Peter DiCaprio tiene más de 10 años de experiencia en la enseñanza, aprendizaje y desarrollo, ayudando a las organizaciones e individuos a mejorar el rendimiento y la rentabilidad a través de la aplicación de pensamiento crítico. Ha capacitado a educadores y especialistas en aprendizaje de instituciones como la Bronx Community College en Nueva York y la Universidad de Birmingham en el Reino Unido. Mediante el diseño del curso Evaluaciones Relevantes de Pensamiento Crítico, así como la evaluación del CLA y el Pensamiento Crítico. Ha trabajado en la capacitación de una amplia variedad de compañías, incluidas Apple, Boeing, ESPN, Visa, Nestlé, The Nielsen Company, la Autoridad Portuaria de Nueva York y Nueva Jersey, Northwestern Mutual, PricewaterhouseCoopers y las Naciones Unidas. Tiene un doctorado de la Universidad de Columbia en el campo del aprendizaje organizacional. Sin más por el momento, los dejo con el doctor Peter DiCaprio. talking about authenticity, about philosophy, about practicality, um, and about the, the changes that are going on. And the task that I'm here to do today is to talk about how we assess, how we measure not an easy thing. Um, so, let's just talk for a minute about the perspective that I'm bringing. And I'm going to attempt to turn that <laughs> So, uh, I, first I want to say, of course, I bring an American perspective. I would not presume to understand Mexican culture, Mexican education system, Mexican student, Mexican teacher, that's not, I, I don't have that kind of knowledge. So my, I, I explicitly, my perspective will be a U.S. North American perspective. Um, my introduction um, doesn't include the fact that a lot of what I do is unconscious bias training in Fortune 500 companies, that most of my time is spent in the professional world trying to bridge the gap between what we're talking about here and the everyday issues of the workplace. That, and this, the CLA, the CWRA, which is, so the CLA is the uh, higher education version, the CWRA is the primary school version of the assessments that we offer, among other things, at the Council for Aid to Education. We also create assessment content for institutions, government bodies, um, and we, my main role at, at CAE is to deliver training to educators around how to create performance tasks that can measure high order skills. Um, so, as I said, I'm, I'm bringing a, a specific perspective, so some of this might be review and some of it may not, but I think it's important that I be explicit about where I'm coming from. So, the, the CLA and the CWRA are the performance tasks that we deliver to institutions. They, are, they come from this need that started in the workplace. And this is a recent study of workplace skills. And if you look, um, I'll try to translate it quickly for you, but critical and analytical thinking, written communication, oral communication, down through even think questions like ethical judgment and decision making. 
What we have here is a rating by employers and a, a self-rating by recent school graduates. And if you see these skills, so for example, critical and analytical thinking, employers are rating new grads at having 26% of, of, of skill, of, of satisfactory skill, whereas new grads are rating themselves at 66%. And that space is, of course, what we call, um, you know, I don't like to use the word blind spot in English, it's actually kind of ableist, but it is a self-awareness bias that we have. Written communication, it's this, there's a similar amount of gap between how people are being assessed, uh, assessed in the outside world and how we assess ourselves and how our students do. And even into areas like ethical judgment and decision making, where employers are rating new employees at 30% and recent grads are rating themselves at 62%. This is an important gap and, and this this self-awareness bias it is, can be addressed by a number of ways, but in the education system, the ability to think critically and critically reflect is one of the ways that we can enter this space. And working in the business world, I work a lot in the both and world. These questions are both philosophical and practical. And we don't, we don't put one away, we don't, we don't drop one to consider another because the reality is ethical judgment and decision making has a critical impact on our business performance. Our business performance has a critical impact on our society. And they are both the same. And the ability in that space, in that both and space, that's where the creativity to create new answers to new issues lies. Um, and this idea that content knowledge, you know, what Freire would call the banking model of education, I'm sure everyone in this room is familiar with this, right, that the banking model of education, that just content knowledge has increasingly become less and less relevant. Um, job, the jobs have actually changed where content knowledge is really not critical. Um, and since information can now be assessed instantaneously, the skills that are brought to the workplace are fundamentally different. Um, and I also, I really like the picture of the thinker. You'll never see him straight on like this. So this is an example. I'm not sure if you're aware of this going on in the States, but this actress, Jenny McCarthy, is a, an advocate against, uh, an anti-vaccination advocate, who says that vaccines have created uh, autism, um, you know, have, 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 have uh, increased the uh, instances of autism uh, in children, despite the fact that study after study shows no causal link between vaccines and autism. And uh, you know, the people you talk to in the field will tell you that it's diagnosis techniques that have changed the number of cases of autism. That the way we diagnose it change. Right? And that critical, that change in the underlying assumption is the critical thinking piece. The ability to see that, to understand that, and to see other perspectives. This is a recent report from the RAND Corporation, um, and they've they've um, they've observed the thing they're calling truth decay, and this is kind of a clever title because in in English. The, um, it, it sounds a lot like the words tooth decay, which is a phrase that's a cliche in, in English. So it's a bit of a play on words here, but it's but what we're experiencing again in the States, but I think this applies to the broader world as we see kind of you know the hardening of 
of ethnic groups and the otherization of people who are different from us, kind of a retreat from diversity and a retreat from an experience of others in many, many parts of the world, many walks of life, that there's disagreement about what the facts are and what the analytical interpretation of the facts are, a blurring of the line between opinion and fact, increasing volume and influence of opinion as personal fact. In fact, there are studies that show that if you offer someone a fact that contradicts their existing opinion, they will actually process it in such a way as to make their existing opinion more forceful for them. I mean, how do we teach to this, right? How do we teach, or more importantly, how do we teach against this? How do we teach to avoid this? And this kind of declining trust in what were formerly trusted factual, you know, sources of factual information, or paranoia, the paranoia that I see every day in my society. And what this creates is an erosion of the civil discourse, a paralysis in the political world, alienation and disengagement of individuals from political and civic discussions. Again, we become even more, enter into smaller and smaller groups, and all sorts of political uncertainty. And there are multiple sources that this, and this is a study that you can find online, the Rand Corporation, Truth to Gay. There are many sources of this, but one of them is the competing demands on our education system. As we've asked our education system to do more and more, and oddly enough, in many ways, less and less, certainly with less and less in the states, where we see, you know, funding goes down, the respect for the role of the teacher in the classroom goes down, the respect for the ideas of others goes down. So, our systems are getting more complex, and our habit has become to create more and more constraints on our education system. Feels good? So, the way, so, the CLA, the CWRA, the Council for Aid to Education, we, in our work, you know, we deliver assessments to institutions, mainly as kind of a pre-test, post-test, a way for the students to take the assessment, and the institution then rates itself based on their student performance. So, a very typical thing that we do is, you know, people entering the beginning of their, I'm not sure how the education, how the grades are broken up here, but for example, someone entering high school will take a test, and then the exiting population will take a test. And, you know, after, in the states, that's four years. What that means is after four years, we actually can start to see the impact we've had on our students. Institutions also can rate themselves against other institutions using this methodology as well. And, again, what we're, we're focused very strongly on the workplace, but the reality is that these are the tools that people need, both for the workplace and in life in general. We want to make people, want to help people become more skilled at navigating complexities of being a human being living on this planet. And we also, you know, we need to, to be able to intervene on our reality. We need to have the power to do that. So here's an example. You know, this is a story from today, that the White House is proposing the Departments of Labor and Departments of Education merge, right? So I can ask a student, I can ask a learner, what, what's the underlying impact that this is going to have? What assumptions are being made by the administration? What assumptions do you make 
about this. What can be lost? What can be gained? We can, we can engage a student in this kind of question. Um, and we can measure it. Or we can come closer to measure it than perhaps we, we think. And there's another story. Um, erasing the Obama era policy on, on um, protecting the oceans. Right? This, this, becomes, this can become more emotional for students as they have to engage with something where, uh, you know, in the States, again, this idea of climate change denial becomes stronger and stronger, and hopefully weaker and weaker in some places. But asking students, walking them up to this place where they can say, okay, we can, we can ask, tell a student, okay, this is your assumption. You don't necessarily have to change what your underlying assumption is. But can you take the perspective of someone on the other side of the argument? Can you take the perspective of a third person? Now, I don't know about what you're teaching in your classrooms, but I managed to get through most of my education in the United States without a teacher ever asking me to do this. And of course, you know, and while this is all going on, right, we have, and we've seen this already today, right? We have this distraction that needs attention. And so, you know, I would say, like, this is an issue. And what, what's been happening with immigrant children in the States needs to be addressed. And it has the impact of taking our attention away from what else is going on. And I would say that education can be our shield against this. And even more immediately, does anyone, is anyone familiar with this? This is an iPhone app. It's called Native Land. Oops, you know. Is this, is this familiar to anyone? Does anyone, know, does anyone know what this is a map of? Guadalajara. Is anyone familiar with these two ethnic groups? These two? So what this app does is it uses your location service on your phone. Wherever you are, you just open it, and it shows you where the pre-Columbian peoples in your area, in the area that you're standing, were. Um, you know, as much as I feel like one of the cyborgs that we saw earlier today, with the, at least I don't have the camera going through my head, um, like, this is a wonderful thing that the internet can do. That when I travel, when I work with different organizations, I, you know, I'm in a different part of the country, a different part of the world, and I check this. And it allows me to remember the immediacy of what I'm doing. And we're not going to touch on this much, but it also allows me to remember that it starts with me, that I'm the practitioner, and that I have to do what I'm talking about with my students, that I have to be critically reflecting myself. And this is, again, you know, we talk about, you know, self-awareness bias as educators. Let me just take a moment. Because what we're up against, what we're dealing with, really, is, if, raise your hand if you've seen this, the Adelson uh, checkerboard before. Is this, okay. So I'm going to ask, at a show of hands, there's square A and square B. If you think square A is darker, raise your hand. Who thinks square A is darker? Can I see more high? Hi. Okay. All right. So, who thinks square B is darker? So, who thinks this is a trick? So, my doing it is a trick, yes. But, this is what our brains do. This is what we do. This is what our bodies and our brains do as human beings. Right? And it's important that we get to a place where we can take the moral question out of the fact that we as human beings, we support our own ideas, we don't want to take other people's perspectives, right? and that we are not neutral observers of our reality. Our eyes, our ears, our bodies, all of this, this it's an instrument that's not perfectly calibrated because if you look, and I'll go back, I could sit at my desk for hours looking at this because 
Because still, now I still see that B is darker than A in my perception, right? So if I take this away, I still see B is darker than A. Uh, lighter, I'm sorry. B is lighter than A. And it's not until I put those in there that I see... I'll go back and forth a bit. I want to make this my screensaver. So... Here's the task, right, that I want to be able to do, that I want critically reflective people to be able to do. I want us to be able to look at this, go back just because, to look at this, and I, in, in the way that I, I look at that, and I, there's a way in which I know that A is darker than B. Like, it's evident to me. But there's also a way in which I know that they're the same color. And I want to be able to have the skill to step back and see it the way I see it and act and behave as if they're the same color. So, so where are we? And I literally need to know that. Where are we? Oh, so... Who here, has anyone here heard of William Perry and his work on ethical development? Can I see a show of hands just so I... Okay. So he worked with students looking at the way they categorized knowledge, the way they understood the nature of knowledge. And we can use performance tasks to measure these stages. And Bill Perry, it's actually incredibly brilliant work, and it's also... Uh, it's, it's becoming dated, and it was with Harvard students, all men, all in the 50s. I think there's a lot of relevance to this model, and it still needs more research. If anyone here is, you know, young doctoral student or old doctoral student, like I was. Um, but there are, there are specific stages that that he and his team discovered. And, and it's much more complex than this, but broken down here, it starts with dualism. Yes, no, black, white, right, wrong. And that, you know, there's the facts. I know I can learn this. You know, that's what the learner says. I know I can learn what you need me to know. And what, this, what we do developmentally is to move into this place of relativism. I'm sorry, into a multiplicity, where... Everyone has an opinion. We can distrust authority, reason, and, and do abstract thoughts. But everybody's opinion, everybody's basically the same. Right? And I think, again, in the States, there are a lot of people that move through the world in this multiplicity place right now. They've taken what is fundamentally a liberal idea of, of moving through development and seeing the world a certain way, and have stopped at a low stage. Because, hey, I have my opinion, you have yours. Let's call it. The next stage is, is relativism, where you can move deeper into other people's you know, reasoning. You can change your reasoning. And then finally, there's this idea of commitment within relativity, where we know what our values are. And I can say, I appreciate your where you're coming from, and I hold this value as so important that I disagree with you on the way, and I would like to know your values more. So, an easy value to talk about here is compassion. You know, what does compassion look like? And, you know, some people hold compassion above um, dogma, right? And some people hold the rules above the kind of compassion thing. And there's all kinds of work, of hate to some work around the conservative mind, the, the liberal mind. And again, we can, we have a framework here that depending on where, where you want to teach, you know, what you want to teach, what skills you want to build, we can start to assess our students using frameworks such as this one. Oh, and this is, 
This is in organizational learning. This is Chris Argers' work around single loop and double loop learning. Can I have a show of hands who this is familiar with? Who's familiar with this? I should, I, you know, I probably send a bibliography. But, uh. So, typical problem solving is we, we take an action, we see how it works. Depending on how it works, we change our action. Like, oh, well, you know, I need to stay at work later and get more work done. Or we didn't. Ten minutes. Okay. Really? Okay. I love you all so much. So, we need to, so the single loop looks at our actions and our strategies, whereas the double loop looks at our underlying values and goals. And to start to create a space for our students to do that, that is when, that is how assessments can happen. So, we, what we offer is performance tasks, and what I'm going to do in the workshop later today is talk about how, how to create performance tasks for your students. So, as I go through this, I'm going to ask you to frame some questions for me today, because it's such a diverse group, and it's so difficult for me to know what the needs of the group were. It was, it's difficult for me to design what my workshop is going to be, but I, so I want you to have some questions based on, on what we're doing here. So performance tasks, it's very straightforward. Students need to engage with some content and have an outcome, right? They have to, they have to, they have, to have an output. And it can take any form. So examples like a dance performance or surgical simulations or uh, writing lines of computer code, that they have to, that, you know, it's something that is more uh, practical. Um, they can be used as measures of student learning. And the, the characteristics are output, that they move into higher order thinking skills, that there's no single correct answer, um, that there's authenticity, that we bring kind of real world scenarios. Um, students can use content knowledge, so you can use knowledge from your course, or whatever course you're, you're teaching, to assess this, but it doesn't necessarily have to be. And it allows us to start to, and this is Bloom's taxonomy of his show of hands of who's familiar with Bloom's. It allows us to start getting into some of these higher order thinkings. Right? It allows us to look at the application. You know, we ask somebody, how would you fix this problem? Right? Um, what, what are the underlying issues? Right? What are the pros and cons of doing this? And what is your solution? And explain it. And you know, it should be reasonably authentic, um, multiple critiques. Um, yeah. So this is a sample of a quick argument task. This is a performance test, so I'm going to read this quickly. Ten years ago, Hoover College implemented a new peer tutoring initiative on campus. All students were required to participate as tutors, two T's, or both. Since that time, grades at Hoover have increased by 15%. Based on this finding, other schools are requiring all entered students to be tutored. So we have a quick situation, and we ask the student, write a response here where you discuss these, what these schools should consider before adopting the same program. And questions like, you know, what actually impacted the grades? Was being a tutor impacting? Was being a learner impacting? Did this program impact at all? What else was going on at Hoover? Um, questions like that, you can, you can have those um, as, as part of your, your scoring rubric, which is, and that's a simple performance task. And again, at whatever level that you're teaching, at whatever grade level, developmental level, you can, you can um, tailor these to your students. And there are also more complex ones. For example, this is, this is one of our complex performance tasks where there's instructions, scenario, quick description of the scenario, and then a prompt where the student, in this case, the student has to decide um, a report for the, the marketing program, the marketing department in where they work about a decision that needs to be made. And there are seven supporting documents that the students are given. Right, this is very complex, it takes a lot of time, but it's a very robust way of measuring. 
And what we'd like to do is design it based on real-world scenarios. And this is CLA's critical thinking scoring rubric. And I would say, you know, in terms of all of this work, having a scoring rubric is one of the most critical things you can do because you can actually, what I like to do when I'm developing students is I just share the rubric with them. I say, here's what performance looks like in all these dimensions. You can be completely transparent with them so they can see what excellence looks like and see what less than excellence looks like. And this is, for our performance, our test performance rubric, around critical thinking, it's analysis and problem solving, it's making a logical decision or conclusion, supporting it by utilizing appropriate information from the document library. So the rubric dimensions along that are around that. We talk about the four characteristics. It has to be measurable. It has to be understandable by the student. It has to, it has to be practical use. Right? It has to reflect uh, the real world. And the students have to have the skills they need to perform it. Right? They, and this is again where rubrics are critical. One important piece is don't, don't get information from the students that, that you don't assess. So for example, we have a, a writing uh, dimension on our rubric. Because we ask them to write, we, we, we measure their writing. Um, that it has to be you know, presented in a way that the students can understand. And you, you as teachers, I'm sure, you know that. That it has to be practical. It has to be meaningful for the student. You know, this gets at some of the consensitization work that Freire does. And you know, it, has to be, it has to reflect their world or reflect you know, some aspect of their reality. Um, and we have to set them up for, to be able to perform. They have to know what the skills they're going to be assessed in are. They have to have a foundation. Um, there's basically just a couple important things to remember. One is, is it going to be content-based or non-content-based? Is, is it going to be content from the class that you're teaching? And there are different ways that you, know, you can ask them to go back and, and look at what the content of the class was and apply it. Or at the beginning of a course, you can give them some new content and, and have them interact with that and assess how they interact with it. So that you can judge them based on how they interact with the content and the, the, the critical thinking. Um, and of course, non-content based, that's what, that's what I presented with that complex performance task. This was just like all the content that the student needs is presented to them in the, in the test. And they're given an hour to take that test. Uh, they can be used both formatively and summatively. Right? You can have a back and forth with your students throughout your time with them around performance tests and give them real critical, specific feedback around the different uh, dimensions in their performance. Or it could be something that happens as the culmination. Like in my work with Bronx Community College, we're working, we, we build the students up to kind of one final performance task. One, one performance task was a community-wide uh, activism program around uh, literacy and something that was happening. Of course, we have to be aware of the amount of time what we're asking students to do and how much time they have. And how often we're going to test. Um, again, this is in the States, this is a super important question for kind of assessment, you know, inundated teachers who have all kinds of assessments that they're doing. And how do we align this with curricula? Um, So, I want to thank you all very much for your attention. Um, will we take questions, or did I go too far? Was it too much? Thank you. Thank you. So, oh, and hello. I, you know, I, sorry, I forgot your name, but you were at the, the workshop I did. Yes. The school. So, are there any questions? 
Yes. Oh, momentito, por favor. Oh, even better. to assess the comprehension or the level of proficiency of the students, is there going to be related between education and labor force? Is it even going to be necessary? Could you, so, one more time, between, can you expand on what you mean between education and labor? Yeah, this linking between um, students learning these skills that are going to be needed for work, mm -hmm. um, If they're going to be taught that they need um, the skills that they are going to need in, in jobs, mm -hmm. do we really need to measure their proficiency level at school? So, I, I have a number of answers to that question. Um, I think, again, I spend a lot of time in the world of both and. So, you know, there are certain job skills that perhaps we can measure and certain job skills that we can't. My question becomes, what do we consider job skills to be? Um, if we, I overheard someone talking about window, windshield washers. You know, students who are, right? What, how do we, so, Do we want to assess their window washing skill? I would say most, you know, most students given, you know, the typical development don't need that kind of assessment. But the question of being able to, hey, look, if that's your world, what does your crew look like? What, what, what's it like to work with the people of your crew? How do you interface with your potential customers? Is it possible for you to, to create more Uh, abundance and opportunity if you work together with your other crewmates. Is it possible for you, you know, what impact is the way you approach your customer, what impact is the way that you that you do this work have on your on how much people might be willing to have their window washed? Right? So let me be very clear here. Like I'm of again I'm, I'm of two minds because We want to live in a world that's where that's abundant, where people live at ease. And we live in a world where people wash windows. So the question can become, are we are we helping them, you know, you know are we helping them decorate a place where we want to help them get out of? Right? And I I'm not always sure that it's you know, that I as an outsider needs to pull someone out of a circumstance. You know, but I want, so what I want to do is give them the tools to know if they want to and that they can. Does that answer your question? Because it feels like a little like, uh... Okay, thank you. Thank you, that's a great question. Anyone else? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, are there some technology to prove or accelerate our critical thinking? Could you repeat the question one more time, please? Are there some technology to improve or accelerate our critical thinking? Hmm. So, are you talking about electronic physical technologies, or are we talking about kind of interhuman technology? Uh, you want physical technology? Yeah. Uh, not that I know of. So, we use, one of the things we do is our scoring, our scoring system, our entire, our test delivery system when we deliver to institutions is all computer based. Uh, it uses, it uses computers to deliver the, the, the test. It uses, in fact, we use a human scoring system that's also backed up by a computer software scoring system that's proprietary and we're very proud. Thank you very much. And um, so, the, so we bring technology to bear on this aspect of it. And, and I want to, so I'm going to pose that question to this room too. We may answer it, we may not. 
but how is technology going to help us accelerate? I mean, it's interesting because, you know, this accelerate critical thinking, right? It's like I want to I wanna question that assumption that we've got to accelerate critical. Like, huh, like maybe, maybe a goal can be to, for, for, for this to not accelerate, but to go deeper. So, I mean, again, both ends. I, again, I don't think I answered your question. But I did, I said no. <laughs> I'll keep going until they tell me to stop. So. Thank you. 